Hello, good evening in Nairobi, Kenya. Good evening in London. And my name is Dr. Patrick Singh. Very, very excited uh, to host this uh, greatness show with the one and only Dr. Jumana Sean. Jumana Sean from uh, Kenya. Hello, Dr. Juma. How are you? Fine, Professor. Great to hear your voice. Thank you so much for taking your time to be with us this evening and share your greatness with our audience. It's a great pleasure uh, to have you on Greatness TV and we've been longing uh, uh, to, to this day. So could you introduce yourself to our viewers today? Thank you, it's a privilege. Thank you, Professor, it's a privilege and a honor, a massive honor actually for me to appear and to come live in this Greatness TV. As you have mentioned my names, I am Dr. Juma Nashan, and I am privileged to introduce myself to all our audience. First of all, in my foundational calling as a pastor, I always want to present myself because that is my foundational calling. Uh, as God has ordained, I am a senior pastor of Springs of Love Fellowship. And also apart from that, through that very ministry, I am also the president of Kavod Foundation, which deals with humanitarian issues. And apart from that, I am also a, a, a civility leader and ambassador of peace, both with Universal Peace Federation and the I Change Nation under His Excellency Sir Clyde Rivers. And out of that, there's much things that I do as pertains civility, specifically for the young people. So I can introduce myself within that realm for tonight. Uh, is powerful. You're doing great work. You're doing good work. You're doing humanitarian work. You're doing youth work. You're doing peace work. That is a massive combination of work that you do. So how did you, just tell our viewers, how did you discover your calling uh, to be a, a, a church minister or pastor? Well, that is a great question. Actually, uh, after my my encounter with God, my encounter uh, that is after my being born again, my salvation back there in high school, uh, that is should be in 93, 1993. And uh, that encounter, of course, was the basis of any other calling that I needed to respond to. It took me some, some years up to 1998 is when clarity of my calling became so clear and by that time I had finished my high school and I was pursuing my university and during that transition of whether to end a university or to wholly be in the calling uh, it was a difficult decision but God in his immense way had already located me somewhere far I am born in the western part of Kenya, and I found myself in the western part of Kenya. And what I was doing was teaching in a high school. And in that teaching of high school, I realized the calling uh, was strong in the sense of the passion to see people's life change and connected to God was so high. Uh, mm -hmm. What I was doing, indeed, I was a teacher in a high school teaching uh, science subjects, uh, but not a trained teacher at that very moment. I was to pursue that uh, training, but the calling seemed to swallow the urge to pursue. So I was much more engaged into the spiritual development of people. Mm -hmm. And so the calling of God was, was, was so clear when it became that 
the only place I could find peace was to deal with the spiritual issues. I was so inclined in people's problems and people's hunger for solution. And this had to do with their relationship with God. And I realized that uh, that it was the place where peace in my heart could be found. Anytime I could share the gospel, anytime I could share the mind of God with people, I felt a sense of fulfillment in my heart. So it came clear that God is calling me towards this. And ultimately, even when I went to the university, instead of taking the other course that I needed to take, I had to go and take in Bible and theology just to strengthen that calling I was feeling in my heart. Well, wow, that is powerful. When I think about calling and talk about calling, I'm reminded of the moment Moses and the burning bush or St. Uh, Paul on the road to Damascus and him being blinded. So was your calling that dramatic like that? Or could you describe the day, the moment, the night that God appeared to you and then has gone on to completely transform your life and take you to the route of pastoring ministry? Well, yes, many times, sometimes, uh, many times people have testified about their traumatic encounter, spectacular encounter. I do believe that I have my own personal encounter, which I can say it was supernatural. Times when you realize that, um, uh, the, like, like, like several times uh, while I am asleep, while in the dream, I could, you know, I, I could get a sense, a sense of vision dealing with uh, preaching. I could, I could mm -hmm. get myself into those dreams. Every time I find myself uh, in those meetings, I am doing something which I've not already started doing, but already because I am in a relationship with God, I realize that there was already a communication which was coming to me in that supernatural communication aspects. But with me, I can simply say it might not be spectacular as people testify. With me, there was mm -hmm. that and that sense where the Holy Spirit of God was persuading me that this is what I want you to do and was you know, shedding light in the circumstances that I was encountering. The people I was you know, encountering and meeting. I realized that I was carrying a solution and that solution was biblical solution. Yes, so thank you so much. And as you can see, the areas you work in, uh, you work with the youth. So what are the key problems that uh, youth are facing in Kenya or in Africa or the world uh, that you're helping with them with the solutions and with the Youth Civility Initiative? Great. That's the area of my passion. And it mm -hmm. is actually informed in the sense that I have realize there is a leadership vacuum, especially because the present leaders today, if you can check very well, the present leaders today, uh, yes. in all aspects, if, if, beginning even with the family, I realize that there is a great vacuum which ought to be filled. This vacuum has to do with preparation. Many in leadership today are lacking the ability to prepare those who will take over or come after them. I realize that many people, whether it is in the education, in the business arena, many people who are in leadership position, most of them are ill-equipped even to handle leadership. Secondly, they are lacking in the ability to, to prepare those who are going to take over them. So I realize there's a big, huge leadership Cup, which ought to be filled. How are the younger people, the younger generation, going to gain capacity to lead in their own generation? Those who are in leadership now are not prepared for even those positions they are in. And how are they going to be able to prepare others? So that aspect burden as I look at the young people, 
uh, I realize that most of them are victimized and marginalized in many areas. When it comes to the space where they ought to give their suggestion, they are just literally muted. Muted either because the present leadership that ought to address their issue is blinded or lacking in capacity or having no burden to know that these young people are going to take over what they are doing. So that mm -hmm. one increases my, my burden to be a blessing to the young people that with my exposure and calling, I need to help the young people, you know, have a space that their suggestion may also count, whether in the aspect of business, education, social, religious, that aspect. So I have created a, a platform called Courageous Conversation, which, uh, which, you know, gives the young people that space and opportunity to speak out and also engage respectively with authorities because there has been a conflict between authorities just beginning from the family level, go to the politics, go to the mm -hmm. church, religious, you know, sector. You realize that there are conflicting ideologies whereby yes. the older generation still feels that these younger people do not know enough. Now, the young people, in the other hand, they feel they have something they ought to contribute. So you can see that kind of environment, Professor. It becomes yes. so hard that the young people feel that their potential is not being recognized and being given space. So with that kind of exclusion, allow me to use the word exclusion, because they, there is a feeling of social exclusion, political exclusion, religious exclusion, cultural exclusion, all those kind of exclusion coming because the present leadership, those who are elderly, who ought to understand these young people, haven't give them, given them a space. So my burden has been to help young people. Yes, they have a lot of problems. They need to address those problems. Who will work with them and show them how to handle those problems? So that is my passionate area. And that's Thank why you so much. Uh, Thank you so much for that service to the young people. But as you are talking as well, we're thinking about the kind of leadership. Uh, because sometimes people think that to be a leader, you have to be a president of a country. To be a leader, you have to manage a big of organization. Uh, to be a leader, you have to uh, be a head of a department to a service. But there's a new style, leader, a new style of leadership, which I believe possibly as well uh, creating uh, with these young people, that this leadership is all about service, servant Absolutely. leadership. Uh, that is not, it's the, the, who is the greatest? The greatest is the one who serves, uh, you know? So we kind of, it's not about uh, being at the top and being served by others, but is you serving and through your service, you become a leader. Let me just give this, our viewers examples. Think about uh, we are using the platform at the moment, Facebook. Oh, yes. So how many people does Mark Zuckerberg serve? How many people does he control? How many people does he lead? If he decided to switch it off now, we won't be even able to communicate with the, the viewers as we do. That's a massive leadership. Uh, does, he have, does he have power more than the president of the United States? Of course, yes. Does he, because he controls around 3 billion people through his Facebook. Uh, does he have more power than the, uh, the United Nations? Of course, there's no other bigger organization than that Facebook, which controls 3, million, 3 billion people. There you go. So that's kind of leadership. So I think our young people, uh, more and more, they have to start realizing that. It's all about service. How much do you pay for Facebook yes. to use it? Zero. Zero. How much do I pay? Zero. So there's a certain level of service there. I'm just using it as an example 
for the other examples I would have used from using something that's familiar to us now as we talk and go through this. So the young people realize, look, innovation can make you, make you a great leader, irrespective of where you are, in, in spite of your circumstances. Going back to Apple, the founder of Apple, uh, Steve Jobs, he used to sleep in the dormitory with one of the rooms of his friends. He couldn't even afford a meal at university. But uh, him coming up with our invention of Apple, how many people Apple is controlling? Again, that's another style of leadership. So thinking about innovation, in other words, a leadership is all about you discovering your gift. I think discovering their gifting is very important and being able to use that gift uh, to change the world. And being able to get the gift and put it as, as the service of humanity. <clears throat> and that leads me to another area that you really focus on, which is humanitarian work through Carvod Foundation. So what do you do in this uh, Carvod Foundation and how do you use your gift and the gifts of those people that uh, volunteer their time and effort and skills and energy in Carvod Foundation to change the world? Thank you, Professor. That is another area. I think it 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 comes from my my faith relationship with God. One yes. day, one day I encountered together with my wife. I encountered children that had you know had their parents all of them passed on, and these children had totally nothing to eat. They were suffering. And I remember they they came in our meeting conference and you look at them, you could only cry because their health was deplorable. During that time is the time that uh, I was moved together with my wife and I could hear the voice of God tell me that uh, the true religion is the one that looks upon these who are fatherless. That mm -hmm. voice that voice was so loud to me. Now, by that time, I had totally nothing. But I realized that I am better off. In my house, I eat. In my house, I have, I, I, I clothe. Basic needs, I have them. So something moved me. You don't need to be a missionary to show kindness. You don't mm -hmm. need to be a white man to show kindness. Now, that began to move me and my wife, and for the first time, we took three children who are total orphans into our house to share what we partake of. Actually, that's where the humanitarian aspect and win began. It began as, can we be able to share what we have, what God has given to us? When we took that step to take these children, because where they were staying, it was a deplorable place. So we took mm -hmm. them into our house and we started taking care of them. They ate what we ate. And from there, it was like God opening our eyes to be his hand, his feet, his voice to the people that were suffering. So moved by that heart, we realized that now it became our lifestyle that we have to reach the heart. Quite a number of young people began to come in our life and most of them were people that were suffering. Some, most of them were orphans. Some of them were grounded. So I realized that now it's almost about 20 years working here. I have, we have heard about 15 of these orphaned children stay in our house, eat from our yeah. house, and us educating them. Now, it has become a part of the people we lead. And that's where Covered Foundation originated, to touch the lives of the hurting people and improve their livelihood. So we are usually engaged in our small way to share what God has given to us. And a number of our friends who we also either worship together 
or in one way or another we have met, who always have that heart of compassion, they have always been part of what we do. And that's how Covered Foundation has been running. Apart from other programs that include optimizing and maximizing the potential of the young people through some training and also some women empowerment, which is also under the Covered Foundation, we are basically, basically committed to touching the lives of the heart. Well, what a great a way to change the world through Covered Foundation, because not everyone would get those children, 15 children into their living room and bedroom and homes and stay with them without having that deep, deep uh, conviction that this is what uh, God is calling uh, you or them to do. One of the things uh, actually this quote I put out yesterday, but one, he said that your greatness is not only measured by the things you do, but also by the things you don't do. So there are lots of other people who exactly saw what was happening. Let me repeat, your greatness is not only measured by the things you do, but also the things you don't do. I'm sure there's yes. lots of other people who bypassed those children without that they haven't done that. Uh, or, but you've taken the step to do and help those children have, in a way, a good life and find to discover their vision, discover their purpose, get to know who God is, get discover what they are called to do, and uh, importantly, uh, maybe in the future, change the world, which is a great, great calling. So how do people reach out to you if they want to work with Covered Foundation? or they want to support or sponsor? How do they reach on to you? What is the protocol? Basically, we are in the Facebook as Covered Foundation. Some of our activities are always reflected there. And we are a growing, we, we are growing in the aspect of our networking and reaching out. We are in the Facebook and uh, we are also having our line there, our, our, our telephone number, our email, all of it is also put in the Facebook or the Covered Foundation page. And I do believe that we, you can always contact us and together with a website that I personally use and at WW uh, Ambassador Juma Nation. And that's a website that we have been using attached to the Covered Foundation. Oh, that is amazing. Thanks so much for the great work that you do among the orphans. Is it Nairobi or which part of Kenya are you best? We are both in Nairobi and the eastern part of Kenya, a place called uh, Nunguni in Kilungu, Makweni County. In, in, in McQueen County in uh, Western Kenya. Not Western, Eastern Kenya. Eastern, Eastern Kenya. Thank you so much. So let's look at the, your last, uh, the last feature of your work, which is peace. How did you get interested into this peace work? And at the same time, how do you uh, use your ambassadorial role as a civil leader uh, to uh, create world peace? Well, I, I remember when I was in the United States of America and then I was vetted and during the celebration in Indiana, I was presented uh, and conferred to be an ambassador of peace. It was such an enormous, at first I didn't really understand, but I realized that I have been doing this thing all along, being a mm -hmm. minister of the gospel, I, I, I am engaged in the Ministry of Reconciliation and I just realized that I'm so wired to doing this. It's only that I did not understand the platform uh, or the platform had not widened to such a level. So after that appointment as an ambassador of peace, I just realized the enormous task 
is here in my hand. I am well equipped. And now it is my time to use my influence to reach out. And where do I begin? I had to begin where I am. I realized that I influence a number of people, mostly the younger people. And out of that, I realized that I need to create a platform where I will be able to model, mentor people to appreciate the essence of peace and civility. And I looked at this and I said, where do I begin? And that's when I came up with what you call the civility camp. Now, inside the civility camp are all programs that are meant to train, to empower, and bring interaction, to dialogue, have conversation on issues that are affecting our community. And what has been an amazing in this civility uh, camp has been the aspect of developing what you call respectful engagement between the authorities and the young people. Now, I have seen young people develop an appreciation that through civility, we can engage our elders without judging them. And I've also seen elders having now interest in our civility camp to come and speak out some of the traditional and cultural bias and prejudice that has made them to behave in, in, in some incivil way. So I can say it's been an amazing experience to see respectful engagement bringing peace and harmony among relationship and among our communities. And I'm excited about it. Wow, that is great. So on that, this peace initiative, or the peace civility camps so are throughout the world or in Kenya initially, and you have other big dreams for the African continent? Actually, my burden has been basically Africa. And of course, with the roots I, I, and the engagement that I do have with my friends across African countries, it is not just in Kenya or Nairobi. Although basically we have the base there, but we are, we are reaching out because this is an educative program. Much as it has to do with inspiring hope, it is also an educative program. People desire peace, but how to get that peace and live in that peace is where the problem is. Everybody desire peaceful coexistence, but you realize that we have inherited consequences, some of the consequences we have inherited from our forefathers are consequences that are very tribalistic, consequences that are very resent, you know, resentful. So you discover people need to be retrained, re-educated, to appreciate fellow humanity and the value so that there is coexistence and there is value exchange. So basically, I may say, yes, we are in Nairobi, but our tender course of interaction, of conversation, like right now I'm talking to Professor Patrick, I would want through the, med the media uh, uh, channels like this one we are using, I would want Professor Patrick, one of these fine days, to speak to the civility champions that we are going to qualify and certify. So by so doing, I do believe London would have reached. So slowly by slowly, we are expanding our tender cause of influence in a civility camp. That is beautiful. Thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation to the Civility uh, Champions uh, Civility Camp uh, uh, training. I'm happy to help out. Actually, as you're talking, yeah, one of the things really we're thinking about is uh, if you think about the African cultural way of life, okay, 
and how they used to manage uh, peace or manage uh, conflict. And uh, looking at today, how we manage and resolve conflict, are yes. there aspects within the African traditional uh, uh, peace resolution uh, uh, ways that can be used today to manage peace? Because, for example, if I have this is disagreement between you and me, uh, we either go to court and we end up in court uh, with disagreement, we don't agree, then we end up uh, fighting each other, and go, you see countries going to war against each other. So thinking about what is authentically African and how can that help in building peace on the African continent? What are your thoughts on that? Thank you, Prof. I don't know whether you have ever realized that Africa is so rich with respectful culture. I don't know. But before colonialism, and this has been my, my, my proposition many times, I've told my African fellow leaders when we are in engagement of leadership, mm -hmm. Africans everywhere have a culture of respect, which is a core value of civility. We mm -hmm. were in our background, and when you look at many African cultures, they are they are designed to promote respect of elders respect of one another. I think after colonialism, uh, after colonialism, the, the entry of colonialism had to bring a lot of uh, new indoctrination that began to dilute the traditional structures that promoted uh, uh, respect. And mm -hmm. I don't think as African, we are really lacking in the value aspect of valuing one another. I think we need to go back and ask ourselves, what did we throw away after being indoctrinated or being colonized? What is this that we threw away? Because we seemed to have demolished certain structures that mm -hmm. were strengthening respect. Now, Prof, you, you remember there were elders. Now, yes. let, let me look at that. Elders, elders, they may have had a cultural bias, certain cultures that from the Christian perspective, you could question. But when you look at that structure of the elders, there is a sense of respect they were instilling in the society. Where yes. are those structures today? Those structures have been swallowed or rather minimized. We, we we do not have an organized you know eldership you know a net network or infrastructure we just mm -hmm. simply threw it away after we got education after we 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 got indoctrinated after education separating some who have to be well educated they are the ones who are now imposed to us to be leaders. So these elders lost authority, lost everything. But I do believe, like in our constitution here in Kenya, uh, there is what you call dispute resolution, alternative dispute resolution. Now, alternative mm -hmm. resolution is in our constitution as a mechanism of using our traditional structures and other aspects on other uh, authorities apart from the court, the judicial system, to handle disputes and to strengthen coexistence. So I want to say my opinion is that I think we have lost something that we already had and we need to go back and strengthen certain structures and remobilize uh, certain structures in our society which could strengthen the fabric of respect and we will see civility at work and peace at work and yes definitely and that's why one of the key things we hinted on was education uh the more we take on the current education 
the more we alienated, alienated from our Africanness. That means there's some aspect lacking in that education curriculum or education curricula collectively, uh, because uh, that the African aspect of uh, African way of life or African philosophy, or African theology, uh, African ways of uh, conflict resolution are missing within the curriculum that we have in our educational institutions. If they are there, then they are not possible. They are marginalized, marginalized because people prefer prefer the Western ideologies and uh, theories to those uh, which are authentically uh, African that can help people in that setting, in that place, to make a difference with their lives, to prosper and live their great lives. So the education element as well has to be recalibrated uh, so that it can, in a way, speak to the hearts and the minds of the African in the African continent or African setting or an African in diaspora. So they're able to realize, yes, this is why we respect the elders. This is what we get after respecting the elders. This is how the society is going to be. And because if you are destroying those traditional uh, uh, elements of, of being, ways of being, uh, then that means culture is gone. I don't know whether they have a system of kings and kings and kingship or kingdoms. I don't know, but some countries like Uganda, I know we do. Uh, in uh, some Southern African countries, they do. And some of those structures are more or less still there, but how much authority they have, I don't know. So there is a way of trying to think about how we can change the education system and maybe your organization and my organization that might be some of the things we have to think about how uh, outside of the book education, we give life education. Yeah, we give an education which helps people live in That's life true. rather than just yeah. memorizing to pass the exams. Because yes. if you think about the levels of employment, unemployment, they're high. Why? If education was valuable, why is there employment? Exactly. Okay, you've given me something valuable, then it should make me a valuable person, make me a useful person. Not after graduating, then I'm hanging around the streets of Nairobi or Kampala or Chansburg or Cape Town looking for jobs for two years. And then why, you know, that means the kind of education you're giving me in a way is useless for me at that moment in time. I like that point. I like that point, Professor. You are speaking. In fact, the education system, most of our education system have become a burden. They are not an asset. And I think mm -hmm. a re, a, we need to redefine our education system, not just importing, uh, okay, we appreciate the Western uh, philosophy, we appreciate whatever, but you realize that you cannot just import everything and bring it in a culture that has no infrastructure even to deal with it. There's a time I was engaging with leaders and it was unfortunate that uh, we see some of our members of parliament when they are given duty to even write constitution. They go here, they go to this other country, they go to another country. Yes, we don't refuse a replica, but you need to question because there are certain things you go, you import from a certain given culture and your culture has no any infrastructure to handle those particular uh, policies. There is no capacity. So you, you, you come there, you come up with a document, you, you are looking forward, oh, our education system is going to be revamped. Our education system is, is going to match the one of America, but you do not even have that very, you know, <laughs> uh, basics of sustaining it. So I agree together with you. We really need to relook at how we can use the very original, traditional, cultural, African aspects. How can we practically make life practical? Yes. Amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Juma, for sharing this great message on education, on spirituality. 
on humanitarian civility and uh, it's been a great pleasure hosting you at Greatness TV and thanks so much to our viewers as well uh, for being with us uh, in the past 40 minutes or so and uh, we look forward to having you again. Dr. Juma, just before you go, uh, could you just say how, uh, repeat again, how our viewers can contact you, reach out to find more about Carboard Foundation, reach out to be helped so that they can create their best lives too. Thank you once again, Professor, for that privilege. Uh, to our viewers and to any other person who would want to also make impact and touch lives uh, through Carbon Foundation, I do believe you can always look at us on the page. You can also uh, get me personally in the YouTube channel, uh, I'm part of the Juma Nation. Uh, you can always get me there, subscribe. And I'm also Juma National in Facebook. And we, uh, you can also get me with the uh, Gmail at jcarvot uh, at gmail.com, jcarvot at gmail.com. That is my email. You can always reach me out to that. And I do believe that one is enough for anybody to reach us. Thank you so much and have a great evening in Nairobi, in London and wherever you're watching from. Thank you so much for joining us this evening or this morning, this night. has been Dr. Patrick Singh hosting the one and only Dr. Juma Nation live from Kenya. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye, Prof. Thank you so much. Bye.